of the questions, I don't know who wrote it, but if the intention of prophethood was to make life simpler and clearer for us, why then does the Quran not state things clearly? <laughs> there is ambiguity that sometimes causes confusion and contradiction among the many sects. Why are so many left why are so many left up to interpretation? I'm going to deal with this thing tonight, but just tell you now. You see, the yardstick is not the Quran for guidance. The yardstick is the existential, what I call the existential state. What existential state means is that we have inbuilt and hardwired within us an intuition beyond reason, yes? Stop me if, if these terms are ambiguous in themselves, so I'll explain them. So we know in our natural state, for us to be productive is good, for us to grow, for us to live. So, and with that came come social values of saying the truth, being good, honoring our word, being good. This I call existential states, and this is intuition. We have this intuition to survive, to promote growth, yes? Now, with that, if we read the Quran, then the Quran yields that growth process. If inside us the moral compass is not right and we read the Quran, then the Quran misguides. So the Quran is open in that way for interpretation. It's the reader who will derive from the Quran whatever they want. So if the reader is surrendered to that existential state and that, to that intuition, then the Quran directs. Now, why is the Quran ambiguous? This is what we will discuss tonight. Quran has to be ambiguous because if it is meant to be a book for all times, it cannot be written in a clear language, in which case the meanings would cease to exist. So the meanings have to be phrased in such a way that the meanings can renew themselves with the course of progression of humanity. Otherwise, if you were to write an exercise book for primary school, it would not sustain their curiosity and educational process in their secondary education. And Quran, there are no more revelations after that. So this is what we have to decide tonight, and I'll be talking about this. And there are many facets of the Quran. At the face value of it, they are not relevant today. What is relevant is what meaning was being derived or given. But the Quran is very beautiful. It's minimalistic. In its minimalism, it allows for further interpretations. And we will obviously talk about that with the aid of hadith on Imam Sadiq, so on and so forth. Now, the misguidance that comes to the Qur'an is not the Qur'an. It's the reader reading it. And Allah SWT says in the Qur'an that he misguides through the same verse as he guides. And he misguides none save the corrupt of heart. So the attitude of the one reading is highly influential in what they derive from the Qur'an. So we'll discuss this tonight at length. Okay. Um, one other question is marriage. Islam emphasis, Islam emphasis on the sacredness of marriage, selecting a spouse with good manners and faith. Why then did the Holy Prophet وسلم, and other Imams marry wives that hurt the Alibet and their families? Should they not be our role models? The Prophet was a human. The Imams were humans. Imam Bakr loved his wife, according to the narration, greatly, that he was hurt by divorcing her. So they said, well, why did you divorce her? She, he said that, well, he, she speaks ill of Imam Ali. And I did not want this particular call from the pit of hell to touch my body. So I divorced her, and hence I'm sad. So they were humans. The, the Prophet's humanity is described within the Qur'an very explicitly, yes? And we want to discuss that on the night lectures as well. But for example, Moses. Moses comes back uh, from the meeting of God, from the meeting with God, and he is enraged to the extent that he pulls Harun's hair and beard and drags him. He is in a state of rage. And the Qur'an describes that when the rage wore off Moses, that is when, when he resumed his calm, he picked up the sacred tablets and then he read it out to them, the commandments. 
So the prophets were humans. Yes, to the core they were humans. The beauty of these prophets was that when they realized something was wrong, how they reconciled that human frailty in beautiful godliness. And that's why they're models. A model is not somebody who cannot make any flaws in their judgment. Model is somebody who suffers like human beings. But now after suffering a loss, how then subsequently do you react? That is where they become a model. Can you see that? They make a decision. In hindsight, it may not have been the best of decisions. But now that they realize that it's not the best of decisions, now what are they supposed to do? Nabi Nuh says to Allah, my son is my family. Allah says, it's not your family. Don't ask me again concerning your son. Otherwise, you will be of the ignorant one. So there you go. Nabi Musa punches somebody and kills them. Yes, he had a problem with, obviously, rage as well. Nabi Sulaiman, <coughs> you find me one prophet in the Quran whose humanity is not displayed by the Quran. The prophet at times would be perplexed. The prophet at times would need reassurance. The Quran says it. Why is it that God is not embarrassed to declare his humanity, but the believers of the prophet are not able to acknowledge that he was a human to the core? Now, he did love Aisha, it's true. He loved Aisha, it's not wrong, and it's not fault in his humanness, he did. Aisha regretted, Lady Aisha regretted going to war, yes? And when she, before getting into Basra, when she heard the dogs, the dogs of that place bark at her, Aisha remembered. Aisha and Hafsa both of them remember. So the Prophet said, which one of you, of my wives, will do a thing where the dogs of this place bark at you and you will be on the wrong? So Aisha said, no, I'm wrong here. So Abdullah ibn Zubair said, this is not the same place that you're talking about. He, he obviously deceived her. And Aisha lived with this regret for the rest of her life. I'm not saying about her character, whether it was good or bad, but that, that, well, I know the way she was jealous of Lady Fatima was not right. It was not right. But at the same time, she's the wife of our Prophet. And, you know, she, the Quran calls them the mothers of the believers, and we should give them due respect. Allah knows how to judge everybody. But in the humanness of the Prophet, he loved his wives. Is there anything wrong with that? And they were, the wives of the Prophet were bickering amongst themselves. They were gossiping. The Quran doesn't hesitate to say to the wives of the Prophet and to warn them that why do you cause such grief to the Prophet? What is halal for him is halal for him. Don't make it haram for him. Yes, you are jealous of what he is doing, but overcome your jealousy and don't make haram for him what Allah has made halal. So they were humans to the core. Yes? Imam Ali was a human to the core. Imam Hassan, Imam Hussein were humans to the core. And they display their humanity and without any shame. This is the sort of Hindu type mythical introduction within Islam of the Shias that the Imams were divine and God you know like. They became God like through the process of life. And the Quran says so clearly to the Prophet of Islam that you're making a mistake here. So he then revised the whole case and put it right. But he adjudicated. And in accordance with the weight of the, the, of the evidence, he adjudicated against the Jew. And the evidence was planted in the Jewish household. Our Mufassalin all agree with this. So the Prophet revisited the case and put it right. So in their humanness, they loved their wives. And, and, and the Prophet is saying, no, he's saying, I don't have ilmul ghaib. The Prophet Muhammad is saying twice in the Quran, I don't have ilmul ghaib. Yes, he did have ilmul ghaib. But then he is forced to say in the Quran, I don't have it either. So that means that we need to now reconcile. What does it mean? They did and they didn't. It's not necessary that they know everything. And if they did know everything, then what's the nature and purpose of their test on earth anyway? Yeah? So that's where I wanted to ask you about the humanness and the image you actually heard. So uh -huh. That's part of my question. But I also wanted to know how do we reconcile the, our belief in Isma then? Isma. I don't understand what we mean by Isma. I really don't understand. Isma means, no, it's not that. Is it Shubhin? No, I'm asking. No. No, no, it's Shubhin here. Is it Shubhin in the team? No. Okay. No, Isma. Isma, to, 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 to my understanding. Look, I, I do want to have elaborate discussions on 
imamology afterwards at some point, these imams had access to knowledge that none had in history. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad and the imams, nobody had this access to knowledge. Mm -hmm. However, the issue of Isma is something else. These people were something else, exceptional. I, I agree. Yes, not as a somebody who was born inside the faith and indoctrinated, but somebody who studied them. But Isma means that their level of God consciousness and their presence with God is so pronounced that they would not do anything knowingly that is displeasing to God. That is the meaning of Isma. Yes? It is directly in relation to the caliber of their godliness and their presence with God. Isma, however, does not mean, it does not mean that the decision that they make is the only decision. There can be alternative decisions. Because Al-Hassan made one decision, Al-Hussein made another one. Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, both of their sort of personalities were very different. Imam Hassan was very calm. Imam Hussein was very passionate. And we can see this very clearly. The Imam Hussein of one year prior to Karbala is very different from Imam Hussein before that time. Is very, very different. Imam Hussein of Ashura is very different from the Imam Hussein that we see prior to Ashura, yes? He's a very, very godly soul in Ashura. Amazing the, the, the way uh, that transformation in the Imam himself, yes? And he humbles himself on the day of Ashura and he said, Ever since I've realized that lying is wrong, I haven't lied. Why should the Imam say that? He said, Ever since I've realized that saying lies is wrong, I have not lied. So what does that mean? You see, it, it, it says something to us. So Isma means the level of God presence, God focus, that does not allow them to do anything that displeases God. But that does not mean that if evidence is placed in front of them, and if they are judging, that they cannot there be a flaw in their judgment. That is quite possible. And the Prophet demonstrates this in the Quran in Surah Maida. And our Shia Mufassirin agree with this. That the Prophet uh, and it made a mistake in accordance with the weight of evidence. And then Allah said to him, that, look, they are deceiving you. There is a lot of hidden uh, information that they haven't revealed to you. So reopen the case and ask for further evidences. Yeah? So Islam is that. In Mul Ghayb, Allah is strict in the Quran. Nobody knows the Ghayb except Allah or whoever Allah imparts to from His Rasul. From his Rasul, his messenger. <coughs> now, when we look at the knowledge base of the Prophet, especially in the Quran, all these are futuristic predictions and prophecies, and they all come true. And the Prophet has mentioned so many things that will come to pass and that come to pass. You know, Ali saying, Al Hassan and Hussein, so they have access to Ilmul Ghayb. So now, here we have to now discern what is Quran saying that nobody has and only God has. And what is these things that they are telling us? We've been very naive. We haven't been able to discern Ilmul Ghay from Ilmul Ghay. We lump it all together. You see? Now, Imam Sadiq, salamu alayhi, will talk about the cosmos, uh, astrophysics, and so accurately. Even today, we find that his understanding of black, dark matter, the origin of the physical universe, the timelessness of the universe, the eternity of the universe is all valid and accurate. Mm -hmm. And he would say that Ruhul Quds inspires me, and he inspires the Mu'mineen as well the Kahirul Qudsi in, 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 in Iran and whatever. So they do have a knowledge base that is extremely accurate. But now, what is Ilmul Ghayb? If somebody from a meteorological department tells us what the weather will be tomorrow or next year, that would be Ilmul Ghayb for us. For them, it would not be Ilmul Ghayb because they are able to discern every factor that is there. So some of Ilmul Ghayb needs to be understood in this way. An economist will tell us about how the markets are going to fluctuate in the next few days. For us, it's Ilmul Ghayb. But for them, it's not Ilmul Ghayb. It's based on many factors that they have realized and they've understood. A person, let's say, if we can program my whole thinking process, he will be able to tell you accurately the next word that I'm going to speak and the gesture that I'm going to make, given all the factors. So Ilmul Ghayb can mean this as well, can mean futuristic events. And futuristic events is how if we understand the world at present now, then we will know with some accuracy how it will unfold in the near future. Yes? But in the distant future, how it will unfold becomes more ambiguous, unpredictable. 
And that's why the Prophet himself said that before the coming of the Mahdi, these are the signs that will occur. Out of these, the two will definitely occur are these two. The rest of them may come, may not come. Yes? So I'm just saying, we can't be naive when we talk about Isma in Mulghayb. We need to be true to the Quran and need to understand that there is Ilmul Ghayb and there is Ilmul Ghayb. One Allah says nobody has, and the other one is so clearly displayed by the Prophet and his family. So how now do we analyze this and how do we place it? So it's all a question of how we place things. <coughs> I have a question here, just to follow up on that. So uh -huh. Is there a suggestion that our Prophet and our Imams are not infallible then? Or am I misunderstanding? Oh, no, 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 no. What, is, what do you understand by infallible? Where they they are sin free as well. As what does that mean? So that they are not able to make any mistakes and do anything. Yes, else. they're not able to make. <coughs> How does that then make them a model for me and you to emulate? Mm -hmm. I would I would require from you the definition of sin as well. What do you understand by sin? Two, they are not able to. They don't have the ability to. Then how are they models for us? Yes. That, that would so make them fully redundant. Of, okay, so what is your definition of sin and infallibility then? Okay. What did you guys okay. mean then? Sin, sin okay. is something that you do knowingly that is inconsistent with the good pleasure of Allah and you know it is. That's sin. Okay. Otherwise it's not a sin. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah? Otherwise it's not a sin. Yeah? So if you do something unknowingly... So, so, so now if somebody were to drink wine, yeah, a Christian, with the sip of, sip of wine, with the intention that this is the blood of Jesus. Through that sip of wine, that this is the blood of Isa, they will gain spirituality. A Muslim sips wine, they will become condemned. So now, there is a property in wine that might be detrimental. The physical detriment will reveal itself. But at the same time, it has a spiritual property. That spiritual property is determined by the intention of the actor. Yeah? It's determined by the belief of the person. That's right. So the intention is now, for example, Imam Sajjad says to Allah, Salamu Allah, he said, I have sinned and I have sinned often, and as I seek repentance, I will sin further. So is and, this do dua that you're telling me? Yeah, yeah, dua Abu okay. Hurza. So he said, I will sin further, I know this. He's been very true to his own humanity. But he said, I have not sinned because I see you unworthy of obedience. I have sinned at moments of my weakness. So he's here now distinguishing sin from sin. There is a sin that is done knowing full well that this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He dislikes it and I'll still go and do it. And another one is that just moment of weakness in which a person commits a crime. So there is a distinction between the two. Both of them constitute sin because the actor knows this is displeasing to God. But in one there is an emphatic understanding that God dislikes this. And still we say, I really don't care. And that is a grave sin, a major sin. And the other one, yes, this is wrong, but I really did not do it in order to defy you, O oh Lord. So there's a distinction here. And these are determined by the intention of the person who performs the sin or the good deed. And that is why the Prophet has said, Inna amalu bin niyat, that actions are determined to the quality of their intention. Yes? I mean, there are many discussions I've had on these things of sin and so on and so forth. Uh, we need to follow them up at some point. So now, if infallibility means that they cannot commit sin, then that doesn't mean anything to me. Because not being able to means that they are not humans. And if they've arrived at that pedestal of humanity where they can't sin, then they've become angels. That they're not models for us. The Quran says, if you are demanding that I send angels to you, because this is what the people demanded. He said, if there were angels existing on the earth, we would have sent an angel. And if we had sent an angel to you, we would have made sure it was a human. Yes? They have to eat like you, drink like you, suffer like you, have all the tests that you have, and then still lead a very godly life, and then they become a model for you. Can you see that? To be able to sin and not sin is the real achievement. Yes. So the infallibility to me means the person has the best opportunity to sin. And yet they are so God-focused that they don't. Yeah? And that's the great achievement. So then our prophets, 
may have had the ability to sin, but they did not sin. Every prophet has made a mistake. In the a mistake, but not a sin, right? There, there is a difference. Sin means disrespecting Allah SWT. I don't see any prophet in the Quran who has sinned in the sense that knowingly they go against the pleasure of God. No. But then they have flaws in their discretion. They have shown their humanness. They have shown momentary moments, moments of uh, regression, and that that's only added to their increased uh, presence with Allah SWT. They've all shown weaknesses. They've all shown their human weaknesses. Ibrahim shows it, yes? In the evolutionary process of Ibrahim, it's quite clear in the Quran. Yes, Musa shows it. Nu, Nabi Nu, Nabi Sulaiman, so on and so forth. Dawood, yeah? All of them have shown their human flaws. But sin is when somebody deliberately goes against the good pleasure of Allah. Now you might say Sulaiman has done this, in which then he regrets and says, I preferred this world over the remembrance of Allah. But then you can say, well, yes, that was before he attained prophethood. That was uh, a sort of a, a test that he had to pass through prior to the refinement of his character. Yeah? So back to the selection of the spouses again. So it's it's okay to say that, for example, your uh, the example of the fifth Imam or Imam Hassan or Prophet, that they made a mistake in their selection and then they fixed it after. You can't after? say it's a mistake. Yeah. You can say in hindsight. In hindsight, Imam Bakir realized that this is not a good choice, mm -hmm. and therefore he fixed it. But tell me something. Why should we be so stuck up about spouse selection to the way that we become? I thought. The Prophet has said, you will end up with the one destined for you. I've, I've given many talks on destiny yes, and what it means, so please listen to them. <laughs> they're, not, they're very qualified terms. Yes, We speak a very loose language. I always say we don't know what we're talking about. Yes? No two people know what they're talking about because the language is so messed up and muddled out. The Prophet said, you will end up with the one destined for you no matter where you search. Now, when two people come together, the Quran says, make this a means to achieve godliness. Mm -hmm. The Quran says, in Surah Nisa, if you find that you can't be with each other and you want to go up and separate from each other, and Allah will make you both needless through His uh, munificence. So it's a process of life. We will end up making wrong choices. That's how it's supposed to be. Human life is made <laughs> to be such with all flaws in which we realize and we rectify ourselves all the time. We benefit from experience. I have a principle that I write on, the principle of fallibility. Human life progresses on the principle of two principles, no finality and fallibility. All possibilities are there, and we will always make mistakes. Always we'll make mistakes. The real life and the secret of life is to then benefit from those mistakes and make something out of them. Yes? And when two people come together, they're not supposed to be devoted to each other. This is a crazy romantic idea that's coming from God knows where. <laughs> yes. They're supposed to be with each other. Yes, obviously they should fall in love and enjoy the moment like Leila and Majnu and all that, do all of that. But after that, there comes a level of spiritual enlightenment where the spouse use the vehicle of marriage in becoming godly in actualizing godliness within them, facets of godliness within them. So in a sense, it's a selfish pact and a selfless pact. A selfish pact for people to become godly through each other, and that's the selflessness. So the best thing that a spouse can have at times is a bad partner, because that bad partner will allow them to activate their humanity in a way that they couldn't have done. Yeah? So thank Allah. Because these tests are meant to be. <laughs> these tests are meant to be. And once the Toronto lectures go online last week, listen to them. Mm -hmm. Yes, the nature of this life. Or tune in to the Almaty ones that I'm going to deliver next week somewhere. Or a week after, just before I'm late. Five lectures. We'll be talking about destiny and free will, so on and so forth. Yeah. No, actually, we were... Based on all that you've been saying, are there books that you recommend that we ought to be reading to educate ourselves further? I mean, next that you provide to us. I think books. books I think what you should read is early history of Islam. Early history of Islam. And from 
early sources. Obviously, I know you will say, well, I don't have access to Arabic and Persian, so on and so forth. But there are certain books that are coming out by certain authors that are making a reference to the early sources where we can see that look, this is something that we can factually say. Uh, well, not factually. This is something we can agree upon that in the early history, this much is mentioned. Further detail are not there. They're all blur. We can't agree on that. Once you start studying history, what, will, what it will do is it will put your theology in place. You will see a lot of this theology of Isma and, you know, Ilmul Ghaib and all of this was not there in the early period of Islam. People never thought of it that way. The way they understood the meaning of Islam in the Quran, the early Mufassirin, was not the way we are understanding it today. So it's very uh, insightful. What it, it, it might shatter your whole world. It might break the whole world apart. But, but at least it will be an opportunity to tread the path of searching for the truth. Right. Yeah? So early history. More than philosophy, theology, anything else. Early history. It will put things into perspective. Right. Yeah? And then my other question to you, if that's okay, yeah, yeah. is, so you, it, right at the beginning you had said about our intention to be good, and that the, if, if, you are, if you are good, if this is what mm -hmm. I understand, then when you read the Quran, the Quran will be there to provide you with answers. But if your moral compass is askew, you will never find the right answer. You will always justify yourself through the Quran. Right. So my question to you then is, is it, I guess it must be just as important for us to be working within ourselves, on ourselves, in order to gain the enlightenment you see, look, that we need. Absolutely. People are mistaken in thinking that this Quran will guide. It doesn't guide. Right. It guides. Allah says, I will guide you to the pit of hell. That's the angels and all had saying, yes, we will guide you step by step till you come to your full damnation. We will guide you there, yes? So it's a full-scale mistake, people thinking that the Quran will guide you. How can any establishment put knowledge in your mind until and unless the student is receptive to knowledge? Yes? So when we go to the lecture theater, there has to be that state of receptivity. But if we go with a fixed mind that, la, my mind is everywhere else in the world, or that I disagree with this lecturer, we won't receive anything. The same thing with the Quran. We are the first point of revelation. See, we are the handiwork of God. We are the talking Quran, the whole world. That is the silent book that renews itself. We are the real spectacle of God's wonders. Yeah? So there has to be that genuine, sincere intention to try and understand it and what it's saying. And hence yesterday's talk, I wouldn't hesitate to go and look at Bhagavad Gita, which I have, and I find it remarkable in its moral and spiritual content. The Bible is phenomenal, but of course, nothing, nothing, nothing matches up to the Quran. Huh? Mm -hmm. I used to be overawed by Nahjul Balagha mm -hmm. until I became acquainted with the Quran. There is nothing that can measure up to the Quran. It's just something out of this world. It's something phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But it needs that attitude. <coughs> Um, I just had a few questions so that I can keep it going. Um, in your lectures, uh, you are talking about uh, people, uh, uh, Arabs getting very empowered and very kind of receiving the message and then becoming evolving through it. Evolving through it. So um, when people during the Prophet's time became that empowered, then why did Karbala happen? And I think in when we are hearing you talk about, oh, they became empowered, they gained so much in a very short period of time, and then they went on to do very good things, like the scientists and so on. But then there is this gap of Karbala happening. So um, I, this seems to be a little bit of a disconnect. Okay, let's talk about that. How Musa delivered the Israelites from the Pharaoh. He split the sea in half. Yes? So they saw that. He caused the coming of manna and salwa from the heavens, and we used to find it, you know, quail, wheat, and, and, and sweet bread. So they saw all of these sort of miracles and extraordinary events and you know, stuff turning into serpent. So he went away for 40 days and they reverted to the cow. What does that mean? And Harun was still with them. What does that mean? It means this is the real life. Welcome to it. This is the real life. This is the nature of humanity. 
the Sahaba used to come to the Prophet and would say, when we are in your presence, we feel so refined, spiritual, godly, elated. We go away from you, we stumble again. We slip back into our world. The Prophet smiled. He said, this is what life is all about. Now, look at humanity from Adam till now. It's a successful story. It's a hugely successful story, despite all the flaws. Yeah? Think about it. From the caves, darkness, insecurity to this, that we are casting our rains over the, over the heavens. Imagine how far we've come. We have survived against all odds. We are seven billion, yes? This world is a treacherous world. It's not an easy world. All the challenges have brought the best out in us. And we, the weakest of God's creation, we can't fly. We can't climb a, a tree like a cat. We can't run. And yet, look at us. With our minds, what we've been able to do. Yeah, it's a brilliant story. Mm -hmm. A successful story. Look at our moral state today. Today, no Christian pope will be able to rally the masses to go into crusades because people have become moral beyond Christianity. You see, they will say, no, we don't believe in this. In fact, the secular states are people who are moral. They're charitable. They value human rights, inalienable human rights. So humanity has become more godly today than ever it has been. Yes, it's true. Few individuals within humanity are messing it up for the rest of them, and we have to mature and evolve. But look at the trend of humanity. It's gone from nothing to this level of, this pedestal of godliness and self-actualization. Isn't that a successful story? Yeah. But in every patch, you will find certain flaws. But had it not been for Yazid, Imam Hussein would not have been there with this magnificent contribution. And Imam Hussein's contribution is a contribution of humanity. And imagine how it empowers us. Subsequent to Imam Hussein, every time the system went wrong, we were able to tweak it again because we had his model in front of us. The prophets throughout history have only done one thing. They've always balanced the equation. Have you not seen in history there's always two sides? We have always been polarized. Mahdi is one side of the coin, the, the Jal is the other side of the coin. They, they evolve together. Yes? Mahdi and the Jal are two opposed realities that flow together. The Jal is a very high, sophisticated level of intellect, which is always evolving. And Mahdism is the same apart from the two individuals. So here you have it. You will always have Karbalas. You will never get anybody like Imam Hussein, obviously. I mean, when you study Karbala, you think, yes, it was remarkable. The, the whole event is remarkable because of the sheer caliber of the man, Hussein, Salaamu Alaihi, and people like Abbas and Akbar. These were just out of this world, these people. But we will find Karbalas everywhere. Mm -hmm. and we need to have an accurate appreciation of what is going on. But the Shias, don't understand humanity or the global human or history. They only see Karbala. So they see Karbala was Tayyabat. Yes? But think about it this way. Karbala came and it went. The world is still here. Can you see that? The world is still here. Yeah? But after Imam Hussein, look at how much the Muslims have contributed. It was Imam Hussein's uh, a tragedy at Karbala that inspired the revolutions that toppled Bani Umayyah. You know that, right? Mm -hmm. It was Imam Hussein's sacrifice that then brought Bani Abbas into power. Bani Abbas then funded their scholars to translate Greek logic, astrology, astronomy into Arabic and to work on it. Their philosophies. Mm -hmm. They build observatories. Look at the huge contribution. But the Shia mind is that Harun Rashid may he burn in hell. I will say, okay, Harun Rashid did wrong. For that, Allah punish him and chastise him. But why can't you acknowledge all the good that he did as well? Yes, why is there this personal hatred? If you want to really personally hate, hate Shaitan. But nobody hates Shaitan, he please. He's the greatest enemy of God, but nobody is ready to hate him. Something has gone wrong with us. And the first Khalifa, he made a huge blunder in Fadak. He made a huge blunder in Saqifah. By, when everybody was saying, Ali is the chosen one of God, of the Prophet of God, and he's the favored one of Prophet of God, he still took it. Yes? He made a huge blunder. But what about all the good the man did as well? What about all the wealth that he gave in the way of Allah? What about his personal relationship with the Prophet? 
What about all the good sides of this man? Why are we so blinkered? Why can't we see it? Surely, if I was a, a true person to myself, I would have a perspective of history that was accurate. Jafar Tayyar's wife, Asma, marries Abu Bakr. Yes? After becoming a widow. She gives two children to Abu Bakr, uh, 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 Muhammad, and Umm Kulthum. When Abu Bakr dies, Imam Ali marries Asma and raises Umm Kulthum, the daughter of Asma, and Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr in his lap. There was some level of cordiality there. There were some relations. That's why I say read early history so it opens our minds up. So you see, for us, the Shia world is a very blinkered world, a very closed world. They can't see beyond one or two events. And they are not even in the real world, these people. For people who say that they have a master like Imam Sadiq, and they are so useless, it's unforgivable. I've not seen a community of people who have so much and who have done so little. They have the hadith that you will see each other in the palm of your hands for the last at least 600 years. It's a hadith that was given 1,300 years. But we have it in writing at least 600 years. We have that hadith and still the one that we call the kafir invented mobile communication. These are a bunch of useless people. They just don't know what they have. These are like kids who have the gem, gem Kohinoor in their hand. But you know what? They're playing football with it. <laughs> this is how deprived the Shias are from a proper worldview. Forgive me for saying this. I, I really feel pain inside my heart that somebody who has Imam Sadiq, and they are at this stage, it's, it's not acceptable. Um, perhaps I misunderstood, but at one point, of if I, what I understood was that you had said that the words of the Quran were not of Allah, but of human words, and you were making reference to certain ayats when the Prophet was... Right, let me just explain that. The Quran, people say the Quran is eternal. That brings in a host of problems. So I want to explain that today. What is the eternity of the Quran, if there is eternity in there, yes? Right. And of course, I'm mindful of the sensitivities of the audience that is there, so obviously I'll go and say that it is eternal and it is this, but obviously a free mind would inquire, is it eternal? Yes? For me the question is, is it eternal? Or isn't it eternal? So obviously we prove tonight it is eternal for the satisfaction of the audience only. Yes? And how it is eternal. So now, the words of God, who is the one who is speaking inside the Quran? That's what I wanted to say. You find Allah is speaking directly. Then Allah is speaking indirectly. He talks about himself as we. Then he talks about himself in a very relativistic language, the Lord of Moses. Yes. Then he speaks about himself as a third person. Yes. Then he speaks about himself as Allah. Yes. Then as Rahman. And in certain verses there's such sudden switch from Allah speaking to somebody else speaking, from Allah speaking to somebody else speaking. And you know for a fact that the agency delivering the Quran to the Prophet is Gabriel. At times, Gabriel is saying something to the Prophet, yes, and that's Quran. But we know it's all from Allah. The revelation is from Allah. But when we say revelation is from Allah, we can't be naive in thinking that Allah is talking directly. Yes, we said the revelation is from Allah, but here Allah is talking directly. Here he's talking indirectly. Here he's quoting other prophets. Here the angel is talking. This is not Allah saying this, the angel is saying this. It is from Allah, it is the Quran, but it's the angel saying it. So, for example, to say, we don't know what Allah will do. Allah can't say that. Can you say that? We may show you what we have promised to do to them, or we may just take you before that. Now this particular thing has been repeated in the Quran time and time again. These exceptions that are made. In the mind of God, and of course I explained this in the Toronto lectures, that why and how can God change his mind all the time? Yes? Because the whole universe is in the state of presence. There is no past, there is no future. It's only the present. And he's the only one who is the one who is making the real decisions. Yes? Allah. So here we can clearly tell from certain verses of the Quran that it is angels speaking. Yes? And of course, they say, and we are the ones who stand in rows, and we are the ones who are in bowing positions. So speaking by guidance from Allah? Or is, is no, no, I'm no. going to leave all the assumptions aside. So you can clear that we are the ones who stand in rows. Allah can't say that, right? 
It's Quran. We are the ones standing in rows. Who says that? The angels. Do you get that? Okay. And we are the ones who stand in ranks and rows. So you will find a lot of those verses in which you know Allah is not saying this. The angels are saying this. And Allah is not narrating it on behalf of the angels as he narrates Surah Yusuf. He narrates Surah Yusuf, إِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى And when Moses said, وَقَالَتُ الْمَلَائِكَةِ And the angels protested against Adam. At times he qualifies and narrates from them, right? The angels said this. Moses said this. إِذْ قَالَ إِبْرَاهِيمْ لَبِهِ Azar. When Abraham said this to his father, Azar. So he narrates that. And at times there is no when they say it, or he said, or she said, or they say it. It's just say it. We stand in rows. We know for a fact that this is the angel speaking. Yeah? And the Quranic style is a beautiful one because it all brings it together. Now I know the minds of the audience will be startled by as many things that I say. I know this. But just read the Quran. Read it again and again and again and let these verses pop out. Yes? And you will say, oh, okay, here the angels are speaking here. It's a revelation that is divine, but what is the meaning of divinity? That's what I would ask. Yes? Here Allah is speaking directly, here he is narrating. Here Allah is not speaking, he's not narrating. The angels are speaking here. So are the angels speaking on their own accord, or are they speaking on behalf of Allah? That's, that's what I mean. Why, why, why is that a problem for you? Because the way you see, I... Why do you need to reconcile that? Why can't you just have an, uh, a question in your mind? Oh, I would like to explore this and see what is happening. Why can't you have that mindset? No, Obviously, no, I'm, going to give you, I'm going to give you an answer that it is through Allah they are speaking. Yes? But before trying to have this assurance from me, why couldn't you have that question in your mind? Oh, I'd like to see this myself. It's fascinating. Well, no, and, and I agree with you in the sense that, yes, we all have to learn more and have to approach the Quran with an open mind and try to you know, take away some of our... our what, what I understood from your lecture as self-limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. right? But I think there, it's both ways. I mean, just due respect, that I think even when you're guiding us, you've also made some assumptions about us as a society. And I, and I think that's fair. I, try, go, right? I try not to call myself a guide. That's the only thing, you see? Because that what that means is that I'm undermining the minds of my audience. What I would like to think is, look, I'm telling you these things. Okay. Why don't you reason with them? Why don't you think on them? Why don't you go and look at them? Sure. So that well, if you yourself okay. see something like that, then you can be convinced. If you don't, then you will see that it didn't make sense anyway, whatever you were saying. And that's where I'm trying to reconcile, because parts of what you said in your lecture did make sense and parts of what you said did not make sense and that's why I'm trying to reconcile. So why don't you have this question in your mind that, okay, let me go and see for myself. To actually go and look. Yeah. I agree. No, that is the yeah. next step. But I've had the opportunity to actually ask you. And okay, the Quran is all from okay. Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's all from Allah. Because Allah is not that one person who sits on the throne somewhere on the sea. Yes? yes? Allah says in the Quran, as we will explain, He's the first, He's the last, He's the apparent, He's the hidden. Right. He's with you wherever you are. He's closer to you than your jugular vein. He comes between a man and his heart. Wherever you turn, you will find the face of God. The Quran, whether he speaks directly or indirectly, is nothing but the manifestation of Allah SWT. But from that very broad, beautiful perspective of Allah encompassing everything. Yes? My own world view is there is nothing but Allah. Yes? It's just like that mighty ocean. When you see little waves, you would be deceived in thinking that there's a wave. <coughs> it's actually nothing but the ocean, yes? as Ali says, as Hussein says. And that is how wonderful and phenomenal Allah is. But we need to arrive at that insight, both philosophically and experientially. Okay, I have a kind of a question. Yes. Um, not having a dialogue with various different sects of Islam to establish unity amongst them? Why are the Marajas not coming forward and speaking to the media on behalf of Islam and clearing up misconceptions? Well, if they are not doing that, then they are doing their duty, aren't they? They are people who are not doing their duty properly. Call a spade a spade. The Maharaja should have been in contact with the Aga Khan, with the Dalai Lama, with the Pope, with Nelson Mandela when he was alive, 
and they should have come to an agreement that nobody will talk ill of another faith. Yeah. And we should transcend our limitations. I mean, if a person has studied religion to that extent, then they should become like the prophet. Yeah. None of the prophets were ever marked by any religion. They were religionless. Mm -hmm. This transcended faith. The religion did not make Muhammad. The followers of Muhammad Rasulullah made Islam. Mm -hmm. Isa did not make Christianity. Musa did not make Judaism. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Abraham was non-denominational. Mm -hmm. He was a godly being. So the Pope, the Ayatollah, the Aga Khan, the Dalai Lama, these are the people, if they are true, if they are true to their God, then they should transcend faith limits. Religion does not limit, it liberates. That's what religion is supposed to do. Any religion curtailing us is not a godly religion. That's what I say. Yeah. Why couldn't have our Ayatollahs in Najaf and Pope at the time when that person drew the um, drawings of the Prophet? said, yes, to the people of the heads of other faith, that look, we will respect all our human figures. We will respect the Buddha, Ram, and Krishna. We will respect Isa, Musa, Ibrahim. Yes? And why could that not have said to the people that look, if Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was here right now, he would pardon and turn the other way. What that would have done is, the whole nation would have been drawn to Muhammad Rasulullah at that time. Yeah. And the people of the world would have condemned that act, and even the people who drew those, uh, they themselves would have repented and been guided yeah. aright. Yeah. So what's wrong with these marajas anyway? Well, can I just make a comment? Sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I'm finding it a little offensive um, uh -huh. to, to, you know, we have access to our marajas. Why don't we ask them why they did not, rather than us making assumptions on their behalf <coughs> as to what, why they didn't and they should have, they should have done that. Because we have access to our marajas. So yeah. rather than... So I find that a little bit offensive. So yeah. I, you're not asking me here, you're giving a comment. I'm giving a comment. I'm telling you my position. <coughs> sure. Yes, I'm telling you my position. Yeah. If I'm in the, uh, the position of leadership right now, yes, I'm the director of all Institute. So we don't know what they're, what, you know, what um, they're, you know, I, 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 I haven't context. finished. I'm the director of all Institute, yes. If somebody looks at me and says to me, why have you failed to act here? Yeah. I would have to okay. offer justifications, yes. And that's true, what you're saying, you need to ask me. But that would not put me beyond criticism either. Yes? Nobody is beyond criticism. Because the Quran says what? What does the Quran say? On the day of Qiyamah, listen to this carefully, yes? It's our destiny, this. The Quran says to individual, well, when you saw these wrong things, why didn't you do anything about it? So the people will answer, well, we saw our chiefs and our heads doing the same thing. The Quran says, then burn with them now. Yes? But I mean, with each, I mean, I feel that Islam is such an individualistic religion. We are responsible ultimately to God. Yes. And so, um, you know, just I find that when a question comes like this, um, we should, you know, we should direct it to who we're trying to, who the question is really pertaining to. And no, I know, but, but does that mean that you are beyond? Uh, does that mean that that issue is beyond discussion? Absolutely not. And beyond critique? Absolutely not. So now, when there is critique like this here, right. at least it will prompt the people then to ask that why have you not done this? Absolutely, and that's, yeah? my, that's my comment. So I'm just saying, why get offended at it? Well, why, 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 why not be open? So for example, if today I was talking about, instead of the Shia Marjah... Because you, with all due respect, you did go, yeah, they should have done this, they should have done this. On so this if I were to, incident. no, I'm, I'm just questioning or thinking here. Mm -hmm. If this question was directed to me about the Muftis, of uh, Egypt and Medina. And if I were to say they should do this, they should do this, they, would you feel offended? Yeah. Genuinely I tell me. Would you feel offended? I don't know. I don't have a relationship with the Muslims. No, no, no. So. I'm asking you. No, but I don't. Like, I'm, 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 no, but I'm, I'm, asking, I'm genuinely you. asking you for the sake of Allah. Allah is present right now and we should be open for Allah. If the question was that the Diobandis and the Brailuis are killing each other, the Ahlul Hadith, Yes? And the mainstream Sunnis are at loggerheads. Why can't their Muftis come together? And I were to say, yes, yes, they should do this, and they so should do this. So we can go this. to the Muftis and say, well, why yeah. are you not doing that? So would you at that time be offended or would you say yeah, it's a valid point and now we should go to the Muftis? I didn't, I didn't argue about why it was a valid point, but I'm also saying that at this point, when we're asking a question like this, yes, mm -hmm. we, there's no, no harm in asking the question and having dialogue, yeah. but at the same time, my comment is, that, you know, we should go to the source yeah. as opposed to making judgments. That's, that's fine, all. that's fine. I'm trying to say something else. I'm trying to say I, myself, have no attachment to any ayatollah. Yes? 
And that's any, your to, choice. To, to, anything, any muf, right? no, to any mufti, yeah. yes, to any Aga Khan, to any Dalai Lama, I don't even have attachment to my mother and my father and to my children or to my brothers when it comes to that inquiry for the sake of the inquiry. Because there I am going to be torn apart inside my grave in front of my God and I will have to be very true to myself. Very, very true. And that is why whenever I've studied the prophets and the Quran and the Imams, I've put aside the views of everybody and tried to understand them for what they are worth. That's what I'm trying to say. I, I that I don't. I, yeah, and the people have a God-given right to criticize yeah. me as well, and I, sh I wouldn't get offended either. Mm -hmm. yeah? No, and I appreciate that. I, no, just, okay. I just feel that I'm not, I'm not an expert, yeah. and I don't know somebody else's thought process. And so, yes, we can question it, but at the end, if we want to find an answer to that, I think we need to go to the source, and that's all I think. Yeah. So that means most of the things that we discuss should be beyond discussion. Because Absolutely not. Everything would have a source, and we should go to them immediately. Well, a lot of sometimes the source might be the Quran, it might be Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and we might can have be. that. We would, uh, no, it, not that. <laughs> it, it, it is. It yeah. is. Yeah. Ram, Ram made, uh, Krishna made a huge mistake. I made a huge mistake right now. Krishna, <laughs> Krishna made a huge mistake. I think it's good. No, it's, it's, good. Good. it's, good. No, it's good. good. No, I'll just say Krishna made a huge mistake, yes? When he commanded Arjun <laughs> to behead, uh, what was his half brother's name? Arjun's half brother's name was a very gallant warrior. Karan. Karan, yeah. So Karan was fixing the wheel of his chariot, and Ram and Ram commanded Arjun to put him to death because he was unaware. Because Karan was way too strong, stronger than Arjun. Ram made a huge mistake here. You know, it's it's not right. This is not what a person does. Because Ram's reasoning was, yes, that look, the end justifies the means. Now, we find that Ali ibn Abi Talib had a, had a principle that no end can justify a false means. So by Ali ibn Abi Talib's standards, I criticize Krishna. Yes? Krishna, obviously, for the Hindus, is a demigod or whatever. For us, he might be a prophet or whatever. So I'm just saying that the, that incident may not be accurate, yes? the narration. But if it is accurate, then Ram is to be, uh, sorry, Krishna is to be criticized at the level of his morality and justification. This is how, how objective a human being has to be. This is how objective, yes? At the end of the day, believe me, if there is no God here right now, there's no God to be found in the hereafter, as he says in the Quran. And he is our ultimate, beyond any ayatollah, right? Yeah. Other questions? Yes. So, my question my example when i want to learn something about the quran i want to understand the quran the way i read the quran is i read a translation of the quran the translation itself already has meaning in it so automatically i will take in that meaning and it doesn't give me any room really anymore to go in there with a free mind and um, come up with my own um, understanding we will talk tonight the moral content of the Qur'an, the moral content of the Qur'an, is not confined to the Arabic language. The parables of the Qur'an and the meanings yielded are not confined to the Arabic language. The spirituality of the Qur'an and God-human relationship is not confined to the translation. Yes, I agree. Not confined to Arabic. The Arabic language is hugely important to unravel the layers of the meanings of the Qur'an. It is. It's hugely, hugely important. But, if you were to read the Quran in English, you do know that the fit inside the Quran constitutes only is constituted only by 500 verses. There are 6,666 verses in the Quran. They are by and large on morality, theology, cosmology. The smallest amount of the Quran is on the fit of the Quran because it's the most, it's the least of the important things in human life. Godliness and theology and human morality are the actual essence of the Qur'an. Fiqh is just a mechanism that brings us to that pedestal of godliness. Yes? So put aside those fiqhi verses. Let's say, because we need an in-depth analysis, even though I don't agree that we do need in-depth analysis, in-depth is very, it's minimalistic. But what about the moral content? When you, use Surah, you read Surah Yusuf, you feel so, find so much morality and spirituality in there, for example. The, the, the verse is talking about eschatology on the qiyamah and what will happen. It's something that inspires God consciousness within us. We don't want to make mistakes after that. 
that is there in English. You don't have to know Arabic to receive those beautiful meanings of the Quran. The majority of the Quran does not require the reader to know Arabic. But I will say, what a waste when we know that this is from God and we don't make that effort to learn Arabic to read yeah. it firsthand. Yes, because no translation is the Quran. Mm -hmm. However, however, the moral message of the Quran, the theological message of the Quran, the spiritual message of the Quran, these are not confined to Arabic language. They are available in every language because it's something that you and I live with. Mm -hmm. It's a truth that we live with. The Quran just re-expresses it in a very eloquent manner. Yeah? There is nothing in the Quran but that you can test it. Historical events you can test, futuristic cosmic events you can see. This will take place, this hasn't taken place, this has taken place. Because, like for example, the Surah says, that the heavens will be like a rose dipped in oil. You saw the pictures from NASA, the Hubble. Mm -hmm. The galaxy is bursting and it looks like a rose dipped in oil. It's mm -hmm. beautiful. What about that content of the Quran? You don't need Arabic, just read it. Mm -hmm. Yes? So, if I come, if I read it the way you're saying I read it, and I come with, to my own conclusion, and every single individual does it the same way, comes to their own. So conclusion you will you will come to the conclusion that stealing of, is bad. Of, no, 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 no. Not that lying is bad. Basic is that maybe. I don't so what know. conclusion I, I don't will you come know. to? I don't know. I, I will you come to the example. conclusion that I can kill my neighbor? No, I think this, these are. So what what conclusions will you come to? I don't know, but I'm just thinking then. Have you ever tried? I haven't tried the way you're saying. I've Has tried. anybody tried to read the Quran and try and understand what it's trying to say? But what is your concern ultimately? That you'll come to a conclusion that may not match other people or that may not be the right conclusion? Is that may not be the right conclusion. But what is the right conclusion? I mean, what would you come out with? See, Give me hypothetically something. What is the right conclusion? Tell me something. <laughs> hypothetically, yeah, so hypothetically, what will you come out with? Yeah, will you come out with the conclusion that you can steal in a non-Muslim state? No. But you know, you say, just yesterday in your lecture, you, were, you had alluded to the fact that the ISIS are using the Quran to justify their actions. That's fine. And they've come to the same conclusion that's, because the reader... Uh, that's fine. Right? So that's so why I'm going to suggest how we read it tonight. Okay. That's Fair with enough. what attitude we ought to be reading the Quran. That's what I'll suggest tonight, yes? Okay. Yeah. Will you come to the conclusion that you can swear at each other? Yeah, you will only come to moral conclusions. That is you will right. only come to the conclusion that I need to surrender to Allah, the will of Allah. Yes. Allah ordains death, Allah ordains poverty. In all these situations, I have to be dignified that Allah has ordained that, and I have to gain something through that. These are the beautiful conclusions you will come to. So yeah, this if, is if, 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 50, if 50 people here, yes, this is an assumption. Isn't but it, 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 it's it, that she's coming in with a clean mind to read it, yeah. right? That's it, it this is. is with this proviso, yeah, that a okay. person is going into the Quran without any preconceptions. Yes, with that I moral see. compass in place, and you read the Quran, you will only see Allah saying, look, I'm not telling you to do this. I don't tell you this. Allah will never command that which is reprehensible. Allah says in the Quran, yes? Allah says, transact properly. Give in the way of God. Trust Allah. I have placed poverty there for you, defeat there for you, so that you may gain in your godliness. Yes, leave it to Allah and gain from your godliness within your within that situation. Anybody reading the Quran genuinely will be guided aright, and that is the promise of the Quran itself. There are no two people who will come to different conclusions. The only different conclusions that will be derived will be by the jurists in which somebody will say, Ruku is like this, Ruku is like that, and this is a peripheral, this is a minor. But they will all agree that we need to bow to Allah. We need to prostrate to Allah. That is something that everybody will agree on. Yes? We need to connect with Allah regularly. Everybody will agree on that. But what is the formal method of connecting with Allah? They'll be different. Everybody will say we have to curtail social evil, whether cutting hands or putting people in prison. That's where they will differ. But they will all agree on that human moral and sentiment that we need protection of society and reformation. No two people will come out with different conclusion. Only the form in which they're supposed to do will differ. But what about a deeper understanding as opposed to a superficial understanding? Because well, I personally, I don't feel like I have enough knowledge, right? So, if I, for example, if, if I get sick, I go to the doctor for knowledge. Okay? So if I'm trying to find guidance in the Quran, I will go to somebody who studied the Quran. Such as? 
for, an, for many, many years. I haven't studied the Quran. I have zero I mean, experience. What guidance do you want from the Quran that you go to I want context, because a, a lot of the Holy Quran is history. You mentioned about studying history, no, early no, history. No, no, so no. The, the, you no, say yeah, the Quran I'm doesn't asking, have history? I'm, I'm asking a question. No, no, I'm asking as well. Uh, you're I'm not learning to... history from the Quran, are you? Uh, of course I am. No, you're learning the moral messages from no, the I'm historical history from the Quran. But there's a lot of history when you talk about prophets and what they've done in the past, that they've, what the errors that they've made. So if I don't understand it, if I don't understand history, because you encouraged us to learn history, so the Quran has a lot of history, for me to understand that, when I attend a tafsir, for those few ayats, I can pick up so much more from somebody who's more knowledgeable than I am, and I don't have the time um, to be able to you know, spend that much effort and time into studying the history. So going to a source, whether it's a tafsir or whatever, a commentary of the Holy Quran, that gives me a lot more history and context. And I think that enriches my understanding of the Holy Quran than just me. And I do. It, I mean, I do, I do open the Quran. I'll read the translation. Uh, don't get me wrong. But I feel that I get superficial. And often I'm misled in my own interpretation because I will go to the tafsir next and I'm like, whoa, I missed that. Or I, oh, I saw that differently. And so I think it's, it's great. I, I, inquiry, I do that as a profession. I teach my students about inquiry and curiosity and exploration. So don't get me wrong. That is, uh, that's who we are as human beings. Allah has built that into our fitra, naturally, curiosity. right? And there is a certain level of curiosity we need to um, involve ourselves in. But then I feel like I get to a point where now I'm going beyond my understanding. And if Allah has provided me with these tools, then there are tools that I should then explore as well. True, I agree with you fully. So I think, I think what uh, was being said here was that there is, there, there's some, you sure. know, we need yeah, to, I, I, let's I, I not stop ourselves. I, I fully agree, I fully agree. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm with you in terms of, you know, I think this is a journey. And the ultimate understanding through the Quran and our experience in our life is to come to a place where we say, Allah Akbar, right? I often say to my kids when they say to me, something's awesome, oh, that's awesome. I say, please say that word, because there will come a time when you meet your creator or experience him where you will need to say that word, because that is the ultimate awesome, yeah. right? However, in this journey, we as humans are so distracted with everything that's here in this world, that we need structure, we need guidance, we need those that have more insight, more time, more experience. Um, and again, I come from an educational background, so I see with how we deal with students. We provide structure, we provide rules, we provide communities, um, opportunities to collaborate so that we can learn from one another. I think sometimes, when, when I, and I've never heard you before, um, so I ha I'm just completely blank slate. I have a question about, you said, you know, at the end of the day, it's me, no family, no nothing. It's me in my grave with my God. But that isolating kind of experience, I think, limits our experience as collaborating humans to reach that place of awesome. Did you understand what I was trying to say? Mm -hmm. What I just explained to you? Is that what, what you understood from what I said? I so, I was saying, that when it comes to my own moral compass within, there is nobody who can influence me. That lady just said she reads tafsir and this and that. A Sunni will say the same thing, I read tafsir and that. A Hindu will say the same thing, a Jew will say the same thing, a Christian will say the same thing. What I'm trying to say is something totally different. Yes? If you can just listen and just say if it makes sense to you, if it doesn't, it's fine. What I'm trying to say is beyond this tafsir, beyond this fit, beyond these marjas, beyond every single thing, there is a moral compass in here. There is a sense of righteousness, righteousness in here. There's an inquiring being here. If I popped into this world right now, yes, what attitude would I have? I would not be inclined to the Shia tafsir or the Sunni tafsir or anybody's tafsir. I would want to know the truth of what it is worth. I'm talking about that level, that we need to become true at that level. At that level, I have no mother, I have no father, I have no brother. Why should I? This is my only opportunity at life. And at the end of the day, yes. you will have no one either, right? Wait, yeah. let, me, let me finish, yes? This is what I'm trying to say. Of course, you live with your mother, you live with your father, you're influenced with each other, through each other, yes? 
and constantly these influences make you and you have to revise them, your personalities. You know these personalities with which we sit here today, these are not our real, real identities. This is a false identity. This is projected by the cradle and by the culture. And the society's demand has made us this way. Otherwise, I'm not this. My DNA is not mine. I'm not a man, I'm not a woman, I'm genderless. The fact that people can change their gender shows that gender does not determine them. I'm not an Indian or a white or black or whatever. I'm none of these things. Our nature is so supreme, so superior, so godly. My whole task has been to ask one thing. If you popped into this world right now, you would take stakeholding of life. But because me and you have been plunged into the cradle of culture, we have grown into these personalities, and now we are finding it so difficult to break through them. We are so insecure. We are in, under the influence of a happy pill. You know that? I want to know if there is a God that I'm going to believe in. If I'm going to give my soul to a God, it will be a God who is a real God. Otherwise, I'm not even ready to worship God. Yes? This is how I am. Why should I worship a God who knows whatever is going to happen, still creates me, I can't do anything contrary to what he knows I'm going to do, and then he punishes me. Why should I worship such a mundane God? He's made a mother for me through the ray of his own beauty, who is so forgiving, loving, and he himself is inconsistent with the nature of my mother. Yes? Why should I believe in that God? I'll say to God, put me in hell. But I will not give you the satisfaction of putting my forehead in front of you. Yes? This is what I'm saying. That level of existence eternally. So today, if I was a Hindu, yeah. and I was having this, uh, thank you so much, discussion with the Hindu community, these would have been the very... Mm -hmm. To keep their values, to keep the role models that we have, mm -hmm. and then also contribute to mm -hmm. humanity in a way that what you talk you see, about. So you see what, what are some of the lessons that yeah. they should keep in mind? You see, we need to minimize open-mindedness within our children. Yes. And yeah. through that, cultivate, cultivate. cultivate their humanity through a sense of achieving those befitting morals that befit human beings and giving them this sense of God-centricity. Once you can do that and open them up to humanity and say the other human that is there is as godly as you are, has a lot of good to offer, and you owe it to them to share the good that Allah has given you with them, and you owe it, uh, and they owe it to you to share the goodness that they have to share it with you, then that would create for an ideal God fearing, God conscious, moral human being. Yeah. And, uh, and some examples of what are activities that they should be thinking about, which we probably don't do as much of, but we you should see, be. You see, I find the Shia community a very boxed-in community. It's the most boxed-in community I've found. My Sunni brothers are equally the same, very close, very close. They come to me in events and say, well, Shia's a kafir because you guys swear at the Sahaba, so on and so forth. Very close-minded people. Yeah. There are many people who come to us in our interfaith event that said these years are kafirs and you know they're Nazis and so on and so forth. By the third event they go out with a very open mind. Yes? But we pray together behind Sundays, they pray behind us, so on and so forth. I also had an event in which I called the Christians and the Jews to have a collective worship of God. So the Jews, Christians, Hindus, Sikh and Buddhists, they all came and we worshiped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala together. Okay. As as people who are worshipping one God. And, and, it, and many of the Christians were really frightened of this. But Allah says, why don't you call the people of the book to come together and agree that we will worship Allah only, nobody else. So that is how broad I am, yes? To me, it doesn't matter the designation of Christianity, Judaism, because at the core level, I'm not a Muslim or a Jew or a Christian or anything. These are just little titles that people have brought about. So, to expose them, to the wider community, mm -hmm. <coughs> to teach them accurate history, yes? At least that history that we can know, we can substantiate. I'll tell you why, I'll tell you why I'm painting so much at the fate of the Shias. Because they have Imam Sadiq, and this man is a giant, yeah? There's nobody like him. You know Jankaran in Qom? 
when I was studying there, some, you know, there was somebody had a dream that the Torah Imam will come there, whatever, there's no hadith about it. Mm -hmm. There's hadith about Qom, but no hadith about Jankaran and Torah Imam coming there. So I used to go and used to be a little, uh, little room and I used to pray there because in my own system, that's fine. Every place that's associated with Allah is a good place to go and pray. After I left home and I went back, it's become a Mecca for the Shias. There is no authenticity to that place. People go there, recite Dua'i Tawassul, and there's a well there where they throw their arzi. Yeah. And now a kiosk has opened in which the Molana translates the Persian arzi into Arabic, and then they throw it. And they make a few, you know, they make a few dollars and, and in translating this. This is what the Shia community has been reduced to. There is, there is no jump Quran in, in anywhere. Yes, this is what Shia Islam has become. From that lofty pedestal at where it existed in the time of the Prophet and Ali Nabi Talib and the great Imam Sadiq to this, somebody's dream constitutes a whole place of pilgrimage. Yeah, you will see that Ayatollah Khui is saying the way is not authentic in itself. Yes? That the names of the 12 Imams were not there. They came afterwards and we took this from Sunni Hadith. Yes? Sunni Hadith is telling us 12 Imams, Shias did not have this Hadith. But you say this to the Shia today, they become so irritated and agitated and defensive, and I can agree. I can understand why, yes? But my job is, look, maybe I need to refine my own language, yes? Maybe I need to refine my own language, become softer, kinder, gentler, but I don't mean to be rough. But my job is just to pose questions and to awaken people, that's all. You're, you're, and, and don't be offended. You're not rough. I, I mean yeah. much rougher people than you. <laughs> <laughs> no, the uh, you're, you're not, no, you're the, not rough. The, I'm just, and, the and, and, and the Shias at large are, are highly offended by me. Uh, and I don't know why. I can't, for the life of me, I can't understand why. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think any group would be offended if you said that the group was wrong, and that would be whether it was this group or that group, yeah. or whether it was a religious group, group or a, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. But I guess, but I guess, I well, let's Christians get to the next well. point. Okay, let's get to the next place, okay? If, if we are closed-minded, if we, we need to do a little bit more questioning and embracing of, of sort of a multicultural outlooks to reach that place. Multi-faith. Multi-faith. Multi 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 in my, in my, in my definition, which I understand may not be the same, but I, I'm probably going from a general definition of multi multi-faith. Um, multicultural, that's fine. Okay, multicultural, multi-faith. Um, so how do we do that? Because really that's what it's about. You know, we're here to listen to you, to I'm, reach a place I will ask of you a simple getting question. to be better I will ask people. you a simple question, you be true to yourself. I will. If a Jew comes and sits in front of me and you, what is our mindset? Our mindset is to work towards a greater good. Yes? But we've already decided that we are on the right. No, no yeah? that's, a, that's a fair statement. I had, I had a, a, myself and another rabbi met at Starbucks the other day, and we had a conversation. And neither of us went to a place where we thought one was better than the other. We respected okay. each other for having our beliefs and practices, and yet going forward okay. for a better good for humanity. Okay, that's fine. A Hindu sits with me. Yes? <laughs> I've already decided that I'm right. Yes? That's right. Okay, an atheist sits with me. I just, I'm like, you see, you, know, you, you guys have to understand what I'm trying to say. No, I understand. There I'm not, are trying, to, I'm not trying to offend yeah. you. You don't have to become defensive. Yeah. You don't have to become defensive. Yeah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not brought me here as Imam Hussein to defend the faith. <laughs> okay, so nobody should feel they're Imam Hussein right now. Yes? We should be Hur, trying to find the right faith. Mm -hmm. We should be like Hur, yes? Mm -hmm. To make that switch and change your destiny. There are always moments of arrogance in, yeah. any, in any interaction. So, no, I, I, I'm, I'm, there just are to, I'm just trying to cut all the peripheral thing and hit to the core. I'm asking you a simple question, because okay. therein is the response. Okay. If I seek with a big turban, with Good Guru Granth Sahib, <laughs> there. You know, fanning Guru Granth Sahib because Guru Granth Sahib has to always stay awake and can't sleep. You know, the Guru Granth Sahib yeah, is a human being. Yeah, yeah. That's why the Sikhs are concerned. And you know, so I'm here sitting with the feet, Sikh, yes? Why? Because necessity has forced me. I'm asking a question, I want a response here, a genuine response, yes? Necessity has forced me to sit with this man, why? Because I have to work towards common good. Common good that is agreeable between him and me within the parameters of our faith and culture. Yes? The attitude here is what? I know I'm on the right, but he might share some of the right that I have 
and through that we might be able to work together. That's the attitude, isn't it? Yes. yes. You are right. Yeah. No, hang on a second. That, yeah. that, 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 that may be your not. attitude, mm -hmm. but when I go to a, a and, and, and and maybe you know, and I don't mean to sound arrogant through my my trying to ascertain the difference of my values and somebody else's values, but when I walk into a gurdwara, I am completely in awe of the people there that are trying to worship God. Yeah. Okay, can I just say, ask and you I something? Appreciate I, I that don't they think are... I'm being able to convey to you what I'm trying to say. If you went to the Sikh temple, if they said Guru Nanak yeah. was the final disciple of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet after Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mm -hmm. would you be willing to entertain that idea? No. I would be willing to study it. Yeah? So then in that case, you should be more than open to what I'm saying. You should not be so defensive about what I'm saying. I'm not defensive. Yeah? I'm trying to... So I'm then that is the right attitude. Yeah. That's what I'm trying to respond to you. Mm -hmm. That a free man or a woman is a person that is able to take away their conditioning. Yes? So when I sit with a Christian or a Hindu or a Jew, my state in surrender to Allah is such that truth comes from you. And through it you guide me. So I'm not going to conclude anything here. Yes? I'm not going to conclude anything. Yes, rationally, rationally, it's proven to me that Muhammad Rasulullah is the messenger of Allah. And he is the best of messenger of Allah. Anything to move me from that position would be something huge. Yes? But in myself, in myself, I have to be at a state of neutrality and genuine surrender that when the truth comes to me, I'm ready to accept it. Because that is the meaning of Islam. Surrender. Yes? No preconditions. Yes? If that is the way, then yes, we can have genuine effort. So now, when the Christians sit with me, you know, they always get frightened. They, they just feel I'm just out and out, somebody heretical. So I always say to them, I say, look, my Rasul, the, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was for me to become, a, as a means for me to get to God. He was not an end in himself for me. Why is Jesus an end in himself for you? Jesus was a creature of God who journeyed to God. Jesus is just a means for you to for you to journey yourself and to complete your own journey, but they can't understand that, many of them, yes? Can you see that? I'll just narrate what the Prophet said. He was standing on Marwa and he said, Oh people, I have no special position with Allah in the sense that I can give you salvation. If you don't mend your ways with Allah, I won't be able to do anything for you. But if a black slave came to me and he had a good relationship with Allah, then I might be able to do something for him. Imam Sadiq said, we have no kinship with Allah. You have to be good and mend your ways with Allah. At the end of the day, it's your journey. And I can explain this further. If a person goes to university, so what if the deen is his father? Success of that student lies in that student struggling and actualizing the knowledge. If that student doesn't do it, even if they are the son of the dean, the dean cannot instill knowledge in their heads. Yes? The story is something like that. We have to complete our own humanity. You see, Imam Ali Salamullah, if he is not inside there, as in the character of Ali ibn Abi Talib, if he doesn't take birth inside me, there is no Ali in my grave. What difference does it make? If there is no godliness in here, there is no God to be found anywhere. It's just a word. That's what Imam Khomeini says, right? That when you entered in your grave, and the great messengers of God, angels, come and ask you, Qulman Rabbuk, say, who is your Lord? If Allah has not penetrated within your soul, your tongue will stutter. Even if you are the finest philosopher through your brain on the surface of the earth. <coughs> That's what I'm trying to point out. Yeah. Okay, I think maybe the last couple of questions yes. we can wind up. Any? any? Mm -hmm. Yes, I have a quick question, but it's away from whatever they're mm -hmm. speaking, right? Uh, as you said, we should study history. I'm not a big fan of history, but I want to find out <laughs> how you, how the, the imams and their family used to celebrate some happy occasion, or they always used to mourn, no. mourn, have no. <laughs> <laughs> you seen anyone like you know? And it's very difficult to the, for us, for the parents, to explain how sh they should be 
enjoying the festives and how they should be like there there has to be a, 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 this is a balance so, or a like a mark somewhere yeah. like no Look, can, can i can i just say something sure ashura used to be one day Okay. Then it became three days, the more. <laughs> then it became ten days, mm -hmm. and now it goes all the way up to Eid Zara. Yeah. This is not right. Mm -hmm. This is really, really wrong. Yes, the imams never used to be like this. If you look at the Lebanese, the Lebanese after Ashura Madlis, they read Mukhtar Nama, Shami Gharima. There is Mukhtar Nama. It's finished, done, and then they don't congregate until it's Arba'in of Imam Hussein. Even the Arba'in, we can't prove that it's authentic. Can you see that? What you see here as religion now, please listen to my LA lectures in which I've talked about religious challenges. What you see here is religion, I'm saying this, please, after the initial offense that you will feel, curse me, swear at me, whatever you want to do, don't listen any further, but go home and think about this. 80% of the Shia Islam is not Islam. Mafati ul Jilan, 70% of it I can empty for you, so it's not authentic. Yes? History that we are following, please prove it. 80% of the Shia Islam has nothing to do with the Prophet Imam Ali or Imam Sadi. Yes? 80% of Sunni Islam has nothing to do with the Prophet and with uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Nothing, nothing. These are all reactions that we have um, provided to each other historically. Yes? In opposition to each other, this is what we've made. This is what religion has become. We are born in there. And we feel that we are the prophets who are supposed to defend it. Defend what? Does it have any historical value? Today, if you were to ask me to prove anything, I'll be able to prove it to you. I have the tools, yes? I will prove any absurd activity that you want to perform. I will prove it through the 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 theology and through faith. It's that easy. But why can't we be true to ourselves and say, look, this is a huge distraction. The Imams used to love, used to enjoy themselves. Imam Sadiq used to be the coolest of them all. Honestly, <laughs> you know how this Shia piety that we have to fast all day and look, you know, and grieve, and this is crazy. Imam Sadiq was, you know, eating and drinking, and somebody said, oh, it's the 30th of Shaban. It's who's tough to fast. Imam said, it's not wajib to fast, leave me alone. So they said, but what about your grandfathers? They used to, you know, worship Allah. He said, those were my grandfathers, I'm not my grandfathers. He was that calm about it. You know, somebody went to him and said, which fast is it? He said, it's the fourth. He said, well, no, no, according to us, it's the fifth fast. We saw the moon. He said, fine, I'll do a qadda at the end. <laughs> he was that relaxed, chilled out. Can you see that? Look at Imam Hassan. What a majestic Imam. He used to dress lavishly. He used to have the best Arabian horses. Yes? And he used to gift them and take them and gift them. He lived lavishly. He rejoiced. He was happy. The Prophet is sharing a joke with Imam Ali. The Prophet has a humorous side. Ali ibn Abi Talib has such a humorous side mm -hmm. that a lot of the companions, Umar would say to him, Ali, say, you're messing my life and making it unbearable because of your humor. Because Umar married a very pretty woman, apparently. Imam Ali said to Umar, I just want to visit your wife, you know, before, of course, you consummate the marriage and whatnot. So he went there and he just reminded her of something, a pledge that she had made at the death of her husband. So she began to cry and lament and beat her head and Omar said, oh, you spoiled it all for me. <laughs> and I said, why don't you stop, you know, your humor, your, your humor. And Omar said, no, there was a reason for it. I mean, an old woman came to the Prophet and she said, will I go to paradise? He said, no, I'm sorry, you won't. So she started crying. <laughs> and he said, no, only young women go to paradise. <laughs> so they had a lightheartedness about them, you know. They had a beautiful human life. They wore nice clothes, they ate nice food. Their nature as model was something totally different to what we've understood. Yes? You're talking about the men. Can you talk a little bit about ladies? <laughs> how they used to be happy? Do you, do, you, do you know the Sahaba of the Prophet, how many of them were women? Do you know how they had their man in their hands? Seriously? Yes. Do you know the hadiths that are there of how the man used to be devoted to their women? To the extent that Imam Ali would say, why don't you just focus on what I'm saying instead of looking at women instead. Yes? And the Prophet used to say, look at these men, they're just devoted to their women. And their women used to actually make them pay extortionately to take them out on lavish holidays. Somebody went to the sixth Imam and the Imam said, yes, that's good. Earn more and treat them even better. Yeah, so it was a very different life to the one that me and you are having today. It was a very real human life. They were very true to their humanity.
So mm -hmm. laughing uh, loudly and enjoying your life with your kids. And yeah. Oh my goodness, it's not, that's the essence of life. It's not like, it's you not know, a bad thing for life. It's it's not like, not yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, because you know, a lot of people like, you know, nowadays, oh, no, 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 we don't do this. We don't do this. Every little, little tiny thing, oh, no, 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 you can't do this. No, you can't. Haram, haram, haram. <laughs> Yeah, my brother. The prophet burst out in laughter at somebody who was doing something silly. The prophet just couldn't contain himself. He burst out and said, well, that's not what I meant. This is what it's meant. You can't be so literalistic. So a person went to the prophet. The prophet said, ah, color your beards and look younger. You know? Okay. An old man comes to the prophet with a yellow beard. So the prophet looked at him and he smiled and said, oh, you're very nice. You know? A very vain person. But the prophet was commenting him. So then he went back and he covered his beard red. The prophet said, this is even better than yesterday. <laughs> next day, he covers it brown. The prophet said, this is even better. The next day, he covers it black. The prophet said, don't change it again. <laughs> yes? So, they used to have this humorous side. The people were vain. They liked to look good, do things to themselves. And the prophet was actually encouraging them. This is what humanity is all about, isn't it? What is this mourning all the time, crying all the time? <laughs> you know, what is this? Black clothes for three months. The Imams themselves never practice this. What I'm asking here is that, okay, devotion to the Imam is good, but at least we should do it in the way that the Imams themselves have done it. Show me one Imam who has done any of these things. Show me one Imam. So if the Imam himself didn't do it, who is the son of Imam Hussein, does he know better or do I know better? When it comes to best practice, look at the Prophet and his family. And nobody Imam, should get offended. Imam Zainul Abedin apparently cried for 40 years. Yes, so, but he didn't suspend life. No, it's not about suspending life, it's about mourning. Okay, then Imam Bakir didn't cry for 40 years. Okay? Sorry? Imam Bakir didn't follow him with his father. Yeah, no. Imam, Imam Bakir, Imam Zainul Abedin didn't cry for 40 yeah, years. You said, but Imam Bakir didn't cry for 40 years. <coughs> no, I'm just saying, if you want to hold one Imam, Imam Zainul Abedin didn't cry because the grief didn't leave his heart. I still cry for my mother, my grief is not leaving my heart. But that does not stop me from smiling, no, that's not from it. laughing, from enjoying life with my family. Otherwise, life for them becomes miserable. And I'm no, unjust to them. That. Now, if that's the case, that we should follow Imam Zainul Abidin, then Imam Bakir didn't do the same thing. Imam Jafar Sadiq didn't do the same thing, yes? They didn't. But 40 days are, I think, suspicious. <laughs> yes, but 40 days was not there by the Imams. It was not. When? Which Imam? Most of the Imams have told their sahabs, moon. And they, uh, mourn for 40 days? No, mourn means not celebrate or enjoy. It. When? Yes. When did they talk about 40 yeah, days? I will find out for you. I'm Do you know sure. for sure? Yes. I have not find it, found it I anywhere. Find it for you. There was only one day of mourning, the 10th Ashura. There's a hadith that uh, the ninth Imam said, it's a very famous hadith, that my father would become sad from the first of Muharram. And on the 10th, there would be no end to his sadness. And that's it. That's the only hadith we find about the duration, the time limit. Yeah? Okay. That's the only hadith, not 40 days one. Okay. Yeah. But Last Imam, question. But Imam Zainul Abdin never celebrate or never participate in a majlis unless there is a, in a, in wedding. a wedding, I yes. mean. He wouldn't participate in any wedding unless there is a majlis or something. But can you please prove that to me? Mm -hmm. well, I I look, look, the pulpit says Imam Hussein didn't have water for three days. Mm -hmm. The history says Hazrat Abbas is known as Sakka yes. <laughs> because he went and got water on the night of Ashura with Akbar, Salamullah, with Habib and all of them. Yes. Nakan Saab quoted this hadith in Shahid yes. Insaniyat. Yes. The Indians nearly killed him. Yes? History says one thing, Mimbar says something else. Yes? yes. So we have to really, if, if we are open minded people and genuinely true people, then we should have the heart to say, okay, if there is something like that, Let's just genuinely research it, not be closed off with it, yes? So, for example, there is so much history that just doesn't make sense. They used to, they used to mourn the marriage of Hazrat Qasim for as long as I can remember, mm -hmm. yes? yes? Now, the marriage of Hazrat Qasim didn't take place. Imam Hassan had five sons on Ashura. All of them were killed apart from one, Hassan Muthanna. Mm -hmm. Hassan Muthanna was presumed dead. But he lived on because the enemies were related to Hassan Muthanna, so they didn't behead him. They said, no, we'll nurse him and get him better because he was presumed dead. And Hassan Muthanna woke up after three days and he was shocked that Muhammad Hussain had been killed. 
and the battle had finished, yes? So Imam Hussein, according to one riwayat, married his daughter off to Hassan Musanna in Karbala, fearing that she would be taken in captivity because she was a very pretty woman. Then the riwayat show clearly there are two daughters of Imam Hussein with him. One is Sakina, who lived on and became an old woman. Yes, maybe she was the wife of Hassan Musanna and she had children. And then there was another little daughter who was about three years old. But the pulpit will talk about Sakina, Salamullah Aleha, two people in one. The narrations are mixing up two people in one. Can you see this? I'm just saying that there is a lot that the pulpit is saying that the pulpit cannot verify. And history says something else. Imam Hussein's whole person on the day of Ashura is so brilliant. The pulpit is messing it up. They're not bringing out the real Imam Hussein by shrouding it in so much you know, emotions. And these emotions are not accurate emotions. There were very different emotions on that day. Yeah? Uh, these people were models. Um, but there was a riot, you know, it says Which that, uh, I've heard about this from the pulpit, you said, that, you know, some of his Sahabi came and invited him for the wedding, and Imam Zahmur Abdin refused. He said, you know, I'm not going to participate in the wedding, I'm in mourning. So he arranged a majlis, majlis say Imam Hussain, then he came to the wedding. Okay, so I'll check that out, okay? Mm -hmm. I'll check that out. Okay. Okay, okay now show me Imam Baqir. Mm -hmm. Did he attend weddings? I don't know that. No. Did Imam Sadiq attend weddings? It's in the time of Imam Zainal Abdin, you know. No, I'm what not I'm talking I'm, about Imam No, no, that's fine. What yeah. I'm saying is, yeah. if Imam Zainal Abidin, yes. Salamullah Ali was affected that badly yes, that, because that's he was true. it. That is the reason. So, 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 so that's Imam Zainal Abidin. Only Imam Zainal Abidin. Only Imam Zainal Abidin. Yeah. But what about Imam Bakhtir? He should have followed. If, if that was something to be yeah. followed so strictly, then Imam Bakir should have followed it so strictly, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah, Imam yeah, Sadi yeah. should have followed it so strictly. Mm -hmm. So when I say that I have to follow it so strictly, mm -hmm. and there's no other way out, mm -hmm. then I should say, okay, did Imam Bakir understand the same thing? Okay. Mm -hmm. Then that's the argument I'm saying. Yeah, that is quite And everybody is able to express yeah. their humanity. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, last question. So you, the way you talk about it, looking at the Quran and all these ahadith and like everything, we have to fix our moral compass for looking at it. How do we do that? Like, okay. put away our, all our assumptions and no. we look at it. How do we put away no, all these No, there will lines? never be a time where you can put away all assumptions. What we do is we question our assumptions constantly. Yes? We have to constantly question our assumptions. Yeah? So tonight I'll be talking about what the attitude ought to be. And then there'll be a little bit of an intellectual discussion as to what is the miraculous nature of the Qur'an, what is the eternity of the Qur'an, what are the changing facets of the Qur'an. We'll be, we'll be talking about the content of the Qur'an before we go into the real essence of our discussions of God-human relationships and where the Prophet comes in. Yeah? Oh, so I've got another question. Uh, <coughs> yesterday you talked about the Hadith of Akhalain, and you said that the Quran was the weightier thing, and that's not what I've heard, so I was wondering if you could give me a silence. The Prophet said, I've qualified this in the LA lecture, so hear it. The Prophet said, I leave with you two weighty things, the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. The Quran is heavier than the Ahlul Bayt. Okay? This is, the, this is the khutbah of the Prophet and hadith of the Prophet. And no Shia likes to listen to this. But I qualify it very differently. It's in the sense of context and less, more contextual and less context. You see, the Quran is minimalistic. The Quran has minimal laws inside it. Yes? So it's less contextual. But the Ahlul Bayt, because of their social uh, context, social surrounding, they have to be very particular. Mm -hmm. So the things that the Ahlul Bayt say can change from time to time. The things that the Quran says do not change as much. Can you see that? So that means the lesser weight and heavier weight. It does not mean that the spirituality of the Quran is greater than the spirituality of Ahlul Bayt. There's a hadith that the 11th Imam sent somebody to Imam Hussein's grave to pray for him. And that person entertained the doubt. He said, but you are greater than the grave of Imam Hussein. You are the living Imam. Why do you do this? Why are you sending me that? He said, that's true. The Prophet was greater than Kaaba, but he still would go and pray underneath the golden pipe because a certain place is reserved for Allah to respond. Can you see that? But we are very naive. When we hear a hadith like this, we are shocked. But we need to qualify it. Contextual in the sense of the Islamic law. Alul Bayt are the lesser weight. Quran is the heavier weight because that ambiguity of the Quran allows for a variety of interpretations. So, 
The Imam Sadiq has 15 hadith in Imam Bakir that alcohol is not najis. Pig is not najis. An equal number of, number of hadith that alcohol is najis and pig is najis. This is what we deal with in Fiqh and Usul. And if anybody is interested at that level, you can go and listen to my lectures that I give to my class, yes? So alcohol is not really najis. But why did he say it's najis and, and, and it's not najis? Why are there these conflicting statements? This is where the Ahlul Bayt can assess the situation. And in accordance with situations, they can say, okay, consider it najis, consider it not najis, yes? Because they know that if they say it's not najis, these people, the next natural step for them was to consume alcohol. So in that case, say it's najis, wash your clothes, pray again, so that you can take them away from alcohol consumption. And on many places, the Imam, somebody said, oh, somebody just pat on me, just, my clothes are reeking of alcohol. The Imam said, your clothes are not drunk, go and pray. And don't wash it. Somebody said, oh, pig brush against me. The Imam said, its consumption is haram. Nothing else, go and pray. Can you see that? In another point, he said, no, 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 wash it and pray. Because he saw that tendency. Can you see that? I'll finish with the hadith as to how we are not really actually accurately reading this. You know these ayatullahs of ours? A lot of them, they really, really want to challenge things but they're not able to challenge it because of the people. So Hui, he was a brilliant scholar, by the way, said of Hui, yes? He quotes, and then a majority of these sort of high caliber sort of ulama agree this. He says Maghrib is when the sun sets, not 15 minutes after like we do, yes? When there are 15 or, sorry, five to 10 Sahih Hadith. One of the Sahih Hadith is this, that People from Makkah, after the pilgrimage, were going back to Medina. So these were Shias. They said, we saw a youth, and he had his arms open, and he was praying at the time with the Sunni spray. So we did lanat on him. We said, look at this Malun. He's praying namaz at the time when the sun is setting. He said, then we went near him, and he was a 50 month. <laughs> so we joined him, and we prayed Jamaat with him. Yeah, this is a Sahih Hadith. Another Hadith, in which they wrote to Imam, Rabbah. And they said, why do you pray your namaz early like the Sunnis pray? He said, because I asked you guys to postpone yours. You didn't, so I'm praying with them now instead. You see, I'm just saying, the real fiqh that the imams were giving is not the one that we are following. Imam Sadiq said, take this meat out of Mina because the Mina's need is catered for. So they said, well, your grandfather, the Prophet and Ali, Salamu alayhi, they were insisting that we slaughtered here. He said, because there were many poor who judge. Now they are not poor hajis, we've got enough meat in Mina, take it out. What a phenomenal man this is, Imam Sadiq, but nobody's listening to that hadith. They're saying, no, 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 it's against the hadith of the Prophet and Imam Ali. But Imam Sadiq was giving the same law in his own context. Can you see that? In the 1980s when we used to go into hajj, Allah is witness. Our feet used to be up to knee high, almost, in blood. And we were walking on carcasses. Why? Because the understanding was, the sheep has to be slaughtered here. But why do you, what's the purpose of it? No, we don't know the purpose, it just has to be slaughtered. So nobody was listening to those Imams, can you see that? Right? Mm -hmm. So that's why when I when I challenge the Shia, Fokaha, the Fakti and the Marajas, I always tell them, three Eids, is this what Imam Sadiq has taught? Hadith after Hadith after Hadith. In which he's saying, do one Eid. With the people of Tibla, with the people of Lai Lai, he says, Sunnis and Shia should have one Eid, Imam Sadiq, insisting. So they said, this is the hadith of the Prophet. I said, look, who came afterwards? The Prophet or Imam Sadiq? This is the hadith of the Prophet. Yeah. This is how Imam Sadiq reinterpreted it. And he's an authority for us. So we are not following the fiqh of Imam Sadiq at all. Huh? According to my own research. And obviously my fiqhi opinions are out there. When last time I had a panel discussion with one ayatollah and somebody else and me. And we all presented our own understanding. Yes, And they're all there available on YouTube if you want to see them. <coughs> Should we finish with the Surah yes. Fatiha? Yes. Thank you. Allah.